Well, everybody, welcome to History of Money. Professor Barth here. We are now at Lecture 30. Lecture 30, can you believe it? I'm super excited because today we're going to get to the Federal Reserve Act. That will come in Part B. But for Part A, we're going to take a look at the Panic of 1907, the secret banker meeting at Jekyll Island, Georgia in 1910, and then the Aldrich Plan. Lots to look forward to today. Let's go ahead and get started. So you'll remember since the American Civil War, the United States has been on the national banking system. And this was a system of nationally chartered banks. There were still state charter banks, but state charter banks, banks could no longer issue banknotes. Only nationally chartered banks can issue banknotes, but there are many of them, hundreds and hundreds of these banks. And there's all over the country. They issue notes redeemable on demand in gold, but these notes are also secured 100% by U.S. federal bonds. But there's you know some <laughs> strange anomalies about this system, some quirks about it, I guess you could say. And one of those was that you had three different classes of national banks. You had the Central Reserve City Banks, which were in New York City, and they had you know a 25% reserve requirement. Then you had Reserve City Banks, which were in large cities of over half a million people. They could keep part of their reserves, half of their reserves in New York City banks. And then you had the third set, the country banks, who had a smaller reserve ratio. And they could keep more than half of those reserves in either Reserve City or, or New York City. It's a complicated matter, right? And uh, But what it creates is this pyramid-like structure where the entire system can, can topple and... and uh, that is precisely what happened in some of these panics after the Civil War. You remember the Panic of 1873, the big railroad uh, uh, boom and then bust in, uh, in a few years after the Civil War. The Panic of 1893, severe panic. Grover Cleveland had to, to run to J.P. Morgan for, for a, a rescue uh, a couple years later in 1895. And in the years after, in the 1890s and early 1900s, public opinion is, becomes more and more anxious about the rise of the so-called money trusts, which is what we talked about the last lecture. This idea that, that big finance, the uh, power over credit and currency has consolidated in fewer and fewer hands, based mostly out of New York City and centered mostly around the Morgan orbit and the Rockefeller orbit. Now, the answer during this progressive era was some sort of institution that would operate with the interests of the public primarily in mind to oversee the banking system and to, to act as, uh, as a lender of last resort to provide some elasticity to the system, but also to prevent the system uh, from being dominated by the money trust. And so progressives had all sorts of different ideas about how this might be achieved. You had the more Brian-like uh, uh, alt uh, alternative of a government-run, democratically-run national bank, a public bank. And then you had the more urban progressive intelligentsia alternative of an expert-run national bank or expert-run central bank. But momentum is certainly going in that direction. Jacob Schiff, who was the head of the powerful investment bank in New York, Kuhn Loeb, which was in the Rockefeller orbit. Jacob Schiff, early in 1907, had this to say in a speech before the New York Chamber of Commerce. He said, unless we have a central bank with adequate control of credit resources, this country is going to undergo the most severe and far-reaching money panic in its history. Strong words. Strong words from Mr. Schiff. And sure enough, a few months later, in October, panic strikes the financial markets. It begins with the collapse of the Knickerbocker Trust Company in New York City, and then like a contagion, spreads throughout the entire financial system. 
to in Chicago, San Francisco, all throughout the country, runs on the banks, a collapse in, in confidence among depositors. The banks in New York City and Chicago suspended specie payments. Um, so many banks went under altogether. Many businesses entered bankruptcy. The New York Stock Exchange fell by almost 50% from its previous year's peak. There's the, the plunge. Now you'll notice the peak was in early 1906. So, you know, by summer of 1907, it's already gone down quite a bit. But, but that's a big drop there in October. And the system, what's going to happen? Is it going to be just a total collapse in the system? And this is when J.P. Morgan steps in. J.P. Morgan, of course, the most powerful financier in New York City and just brute personality, organized a team of bank executives at his mansion in New York and, and compelled them to devise some sort of plan. And this team of banking executives uh, uh, oversaw the, uh, the uh, redirecting money between different banks, purchasing stocks of, of corporations that were otherwise sound and healthy, but whose, whose stock had plummeted because of the loss of confidence in the system, um, securing international lines of credit, all sorts of maneuvering. Uh, Morgan um, uh, pledged sums of money to, to deposit in some of the banks. John D. Rockefeller stepped in and, and uh, uh, made a major deposit of millions of dollars into the banking system. Probably the most important move was actually taken by the, the U.S. Treasury. The Treasury Secretary of the United States earmarked $35 million, $35 million in federal money to deposit in New York City banks. By the way, most of those banks were Morgan banks, right? Most of those banks were Morgan banks. But that was the big move that really shored up the system. Nevertheless, Morgan primarily gets the credit and out of this crisis, it, it appears that Morgan is just the, the most powerful man in America at this point. Morgan acted almost like uh, you know, uh, his own central bank. <laughs> Morgan is, is a central bank in, in, in man form, essentially, and this cartoon captures that. In reality, some of uh, uh, much of that was exaggerated like I said, but that is the perception. And it was a quick recovery, okay? Look at that recovery, that's, that's quick. So this wasn't a depression, all right? A lot of businesses liquidated, liquidated. many of them were saved through uh, that last minute intervention, but look at that, that's a quick bounce back. But it was enough of a shock to uh, really jolt the uh, Wall Street and and the public in general. And after this panic, banker and business opinion coalesce behind the idea of we need banking reform. And what does banking reform mean? It's another way of saying we need a central bank. We need a central bank. And the blame for the panic was not on you know the different quirks of the national banking system, which were many. The blame of the panic was placed on, oh, it's the, the rural and the country banks. There's too many of them. The banking system is too decentralized. We have too many banks spread out throughout the country, and they were blamed primarily for the panic. Well, this is when a senator from Rhode Island steps in, Nelson Aldrich. Nelson Aldrich. Senator Aldrich was uh, represented the state of Rhode Island from 1881 to 1911. He's also the head of the Senate Finance Committee. Aldrich was a well-connected man. In fact, his daughter married the son of John D. Rockefeller. So uh, Nelson Aldrich was the father-in-law of John D. Rockefeller Jr., not a bad uh, arrangement there uh, for his daughter, but also for, for Aldrich. Aldrich was a strong Republican. He served in the Union Army during the Civil War. He supported high protective tariffs. Uh, he uh, later sponsored the, uh, or sponsored the 16th Amendment, which allowed for a direct federal income tax. 
but for our purposes, Aldrich um, headed this uh, new commission, a Senate commission, to investigate this question of currency and banking. It was called the National Monetary Commission. And this commission was to, to investigate the question and, and spent a good two years about, uh, uh, you know, um, talking to experts. It was, this commission was, was uh, the official members were senators. However, the commission also hired expert staff to do the research. And these expert staff were recommended to Aldrich from the Rockefeller orbit, the Morgan orbit, and all the different banks um, under them. I mean, his son-in-law is John D. Rockefeller Jr. So that's not much of a surprise. And so Rockefeller, Morgan, Kumo people filled the expert staff positions within this commission. And then the different uh, staff members and, and some of the senators toured Europe and talked to different heads of major European central banks and so now the task you know this was a really a predetermined conclusion Aldrich knew going into it that a central bank was what he really wanted right he wanted a central bank and so it's not that they just you know happened to discover oh a central bank will be a might be a good idea for the United States they went into it already with that predetermined opinion the the goal here was to construct um, to hammer out the details of what will that central bank look like exactly and then the other goal here was to mobilize public opinion okay and this this was done by uh you know the leaders of public opinion the press intelligentsia um, major newspapers were contacted and uh, they agreed to uh, write um, to run editorials pointing out the uh, the glories of central banking. Uh, members of uh, uh, the staff uh, finance academ uh, academic symposia, and these academic symposia were uh, would uh, address the question of of currency and banking. And the opinion, uh, the consensus was, we need banking reform along the lines of a central bank. But the details still need to be hammered out. Now, in September 1909, the President of the United States, who was a Republican, remember Aldrich is a Republican as well, President of the United States, William Howard, William Howard Taft, came out publicly and endorsed the idea of a central bank. Taft was the first U.S. president since before the Civil War to a call for the creation of a central bank. So that was a big move right there as well. You got to hammer out the details, and that's where Jekyll Island enters the picture. Jekyll Island, Georgia. And you know what? I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause here, and I'm going to make that Part B. Jekyll Island, Georgia, and then Nelson Aldrich. All right? So Part B, we'll take a look at, uh, at what happened at Jekyll Island. Take a look at the Aldrich plan, and then for part C, we'll look at the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. See you for part B.